I mean, I think it's, you know, food is always about the company and, and, and the exploration of food. You know, for me, it's as much the journey of like getting the perfect meal as it is ever eating it. Um, it's about how things are coming together and all of the elements which make, you know, a meal or a room sink. Okay, uh, today on Dirty Linen, I don't know, I'm so excited because I've been wanting to chat to Long Prawn for so long. Yes, Long Prawn. Do you know what or who that is? Uh, Long Prawn is an artistic food practice that delivers, I'm reading from their website, rigorously researched food expertise, heavily seasoned with creative event design. Uh, Long Prawn is, well, part of Long Prawn is Fred Mora. Fred, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thanks so much, Danny. Yeah, I guess I'm probably the tail end of the long prawn, I think. <laughs> well, each end of the prawn is very important. One does not exist without the other. Um, <laughs> so the most recent long prawn uh, event that I intersected with was on a, on a ferry on the Yarra and I made an oyster knife out of um, recycled plastic. And I think about long prawn every day because that oyster knife sits right above the coffee machine. So it is frequently visited. Um, but yeah, so thank you for that experience. Of course, yeah, it was a great event and um, our second event on a boat, which makes it quite fun to be floating, doing floating events as well as uh, land-based ones. <laughs> yeah, well, I, um, I don't even know where to start, but I feel like we should start with you explaining what Long Prawn is in your own words. Of course, yeah. So um, I run Long Prawn um, with, with the other half of the prawn, who's Lauren Stevens. And I guess, yeah, it is hard to explain what we do, but I think that's testament to the really quite amazing variation in the projects we do. We kind of dance between doing, you know, food at events and um, or more research-based projects or workshops sometimes or small pieces of content or research that we release in different ways. I guess we just find food as just the greatest medium to get people thinking and talking. So with any of our events, yes, of course, there's food, there's often wine, but we kind of see that as one of the elements um, to help people kind of, you know, traverse other ideas or, or connect in, to each other in different ways. Um, so, yeah, each event is very different, Danny, and I, and, and I appreciate that it is hard to capture in kind of one overview. So, um, yeah, we definitely recommend coming to some of our events, and I think that's the best way to get a sense of what we do. Well, I mean, do you consider yourselves artists? I mean, do you consider it art practice? Is it hospitality? Is it, yeah, I mean, you know, how do you think about what you do? Yeah, it's an awesome question. Um, we had an interesting person slide into our DMs once and ask if we were cosplaying hospitality. Um, and in many ways we are and we really like that. You know, I think we exist in a space that is maybe a little bit removed from hospitality, but that gives us a lot of freedom to, you know, do things differently. And I think we've always liked to kind of skirt around that. And, you know, we definitely do provide you know, catering at times, but we always do it in a way that feels unique to us and isn't too kind of weighed down by either expectation of a restaurant or any precedence around, you know, hospitality experience that might, people might be familiar with. Um, not sure that we'd kind of full, fully fall into the artist category either, but, you know, we do work with our hands a lot and we make a lot of things for all our events. There's a lot of elements, whether that's, you know, little things that hang off a wine glass or tablecloths or um, outfits or aprons, you know, all of those elements are very touched by us and um, we think are equally as important as an entree or, a, you know, a sweet at the end of a nice meal. So, yeah, it's a, it's a mad mix. <laughs> it's really interesting that concept of the precedent because I guess one of the uh, the most pressing issues in any ongoing hospitality business is consistency. It is that, you know, delivery of a reliable experience, you know, that people know what they're coming back for. And I suppose you've really eliminated that uh, in most ways, but I guess what people can expect from Long Prawn is something different. So it's, yeah, it's a really interesting way to think about freeing yourself from expectation but also I guess you create a lot of expectation too yeah it, it's an interesting yeah it's an interest it's not necessarily by design but I think there's something really nice in 
um, like the shared discovery, you know, at our events. And you would have maybe felt this with the, you know, the oyster shucking event, Danny, like we're, we're kind of discovering things together with our audience. And um, of course, we set them up to succeed, but, you know, not always. And I think that that's kind of an open and honest way of looking at food. You know, it's not always about perfection but having a connection with your ingredients and processes and the people who provide your food and you know for us that that is what we try and share through all of our events is a bit of a kind of wider journey rather than a kind of finished and refined plate. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, my oyster knife is certainly not finished or refined. It is very lumpy and close to unusable. But I guess, you know, part of what we were exploring in that event was we were on a boat and we were thinking about, you know, what happens underwater. We were learning how to shuck oysters from an oyster shucker guy and we were thinking about, you know, ocean plastic and and food waste and the environment and, um, you know, our part in all of that. Uh, and we were also just having a fun craft activity activity like melting plastic on a toasty maker and um, squelching it (laughs) with our gloved hands into a more or less handle shape. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome to be able to kind of have a snack and do an activity. I think it's really fun and unlocks, I think, a lot of, you know, we spend a lot of time on computers. So using your hands and having a chat and having a drink, I think, is really something we all need at the moment. Yeah, totally. Well, speaking about things we all need at the moment, sunshine is among those. And tell me where we find you today, Fred. Well, um, you know, I hope wherever the listeners are, they're not too cold and, and miserable because yeah, we are, we were in Bali at the moment at Potato Head um, doing a short residency um, upcoming this weekend. They have their Hedonism event, which is three days of sustainability, art, music, food, um, and yeah, we're really lucky to be doing a couple of events at it. So yeah, we've been here since, um, since Monday night and yeah, it's been amazing. It's, it's a really wonderful and creative place to be and awesome place to be thinking about food as well. So what is the event? So we have something actually not dissimilar to some, to the workshop which you participated in. We're doing a seafood tools workshop again. So we're looking at a wider expanse of tools. Um, we're pairing with a local seafood expert here called Impact Local. His name's Ryan, and he's you know an amazing an amazing advocate for really interesting and sustainable seafoods um, within in- Indonesia. Um, so the event will be initially a workshop so we'll be making seafood tools again so we might do some oyster shuckers but we want to expand it to things like crab crackers fish scalers um you know the wide expanse of tools that you might need to either break down seafood or eat some seafood um we'll we'll conduct a small workshop kind of customizing those tools and um yeah, or adding handles to those tools. And then um, Brian from MPAC Local will bring out a huge spread of seafood and everyone can really test their metal, so to speak, and um, devour kind of a, a wonderful spread um, together. So that's one of the events. We're also doing a reading of our um, of our new cookbook, which has just been released, um, which is very exciting. This is its official launch. Um, and then thirdly, we're also doing a, a, a rooftop takeover with the amazing rough rice from Tasmania. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a jam-packed weekend. But um, That's so good. Yeah. So rough rice, Adam James, um, has also appeared on the podcast. Um, and, yeah, I think he's amazing, everything that he does around fermentation and just, uh, just a great communicator around, yeah, just like the real spirit and soul of um, – yeah, the microbial activities that can happen to food right in front of your eyes without you knowing. And yeah, just that's that I was so exciting to so excited to see that you guys were collaborating. And um, yeah, on the question of the book, which I'm actually holding in my hand, it is (laughs) so cute and cheeky. It's called Devils on Horseback. And there is a (laughs) besuited devil in human form sitting on horseback on the cover. The cookbook, A Global Etymology of Oddly Named Dishes. So Fred, do you want to just run through a couple of examples of um, the content uh, of this book? Yeah. So um, the world holds a trove of dishes that have terrific names, but what we discovered is there's a whole bunch of dishes that really their names have almost nothing to do with any of the ingredients, you know, 
think of spotted dick or <laughs> ants climbing a log or pigs in blankets or nuns farts, you know, you, you, you hear these and when you put them in a list, you start to really wonder how these things got their names. And that's what this book does. It kind of explores some of the etymology and the nomenclature of, um, of how dishes got their names. And sadly, we think it's something that's kind of fallen out of practice. So we're hoping the book kind of ignites a bit of creativity with chefs and a bit of courage to get back to, um, yeah, adding stories into, into dishes. You know, I think there's a wonderful transparency in, in menus that list all the ingredients, but, you know, perhaps a greater conversation is started if, if we name things like Spotted Dick or Buddha Jumps Over the Wall. So um, the book is, you know, quite different to many cookbooks, I guess, released at the moment where it's, I guess, taking a more historical look at food. Um, there's wonderful recipes in there. There's beautiful illustrations. Um, and then rather than photographing the dishes as they as they are in reality, we decided to shoot the actual yeah, the actual name of, of each dish. So, yeah, the devil on the horse, devil on horseback is quite literally a devil on a horse. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a fun read. Yeah, it's so interesting that uh, that you, we see less of that sort of naming these days. It's um, because you'd think, you know, with uh, communication being so instant and, and widespread that it would be easy for names to catch on but for some reason perhaps the name of a dish is a slow bedding down rather than this sort of wildfire wildfire that takes hold yeah i think you know you know recent you know recent creativity in names goes as far as you know merging two things together like the cronut or something but um what we think the power of a name does is it it connects you to a, a wider history and you know when reading this book you'll discover that there's no right answer of how anything got its name but it allows people to attach stories or theories or folklore, um, yeah, a bit of you know, a bit of magic behind the dish, and and also it, it, we also like that it kind of it gives competition. So you know, you, you can you can boast that you do the best version of this dish or that dish. So yeah, we think it's something that's fallen out of practice, but maybe maybe hopefully Devils on Horseback, the cookbook, kind of inspires that. But at the very least, it's it's kind of fun and, and fun and, you know, for those people who really like to find the backstories with food and a lot of dinner party fodder in that book. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so true. Well, So will your um, book events feature snacks from the book? Yeah, we so the event we're doing on the weekend we've called a four D reading because we want to um, incorporate into the reading um, certainly the food, but also sounds and costume and makeup. So um, yeah, I guess the giving the energy of the book and bringing it into real life. So um, we don't have a, a Melbourne event planned or any other future book launch plans, but there definitely will be one. So um, if your audience is based there or some of them are based there, we hope they can come too. Mm, absolutely. One thing that um, I haven't seen before that is in your book is a sort of alt text describing the images. Um, so, yeah, I've seen seen it on Twitter and on Instagram where you describe the images for people who aren't able to um, see them. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, um, you know, it's another form of accessibility. Obviously, it's something that is more included in digital formats because, um, you know, people have screen readers and that's really helpful. But, you know, we hope that, you know, reading to one another is still something that gets done. And, and if so, we wanted to have a little bit of, you know, control or, you know, we wanted to give as much colour to that element as the rest of the book. So, um, yeah, I think it's just another element and a, a different approach to accessibility in print. But, um, yeah, I hope people enjoy reading them as well because, you know, sometimes it's easy to flick past an image and not take in all the elements. So slowing down and reading all the detail can be can be kind of add something else also. Yeah, definitely. And also, it yeah, it's an insight into the way another person sees things. Sometimes, yeah, different details will be picked up or... Yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely has slowed me down, and I think that's really nice. Yeah, I think alt text can be something that's really beautiful and considered and thoughtful. Um, so yeah, encourage everyone to spend additional time doing it if they can. So Fred, I'd love to um, get your perspective on barley. Like it feels like you know half of Australia is over there at the moment. Actually, that unless they're in bloody Italy, like you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, what is what is it like there? 
Oh, it's amazing. I, I, I haven't spent much time here, so um, I'm, I'm definitely no expert and, and, and shouldn't talk at length. But um, yeah, you know, we ate two amazing <laughs> pork dishes yesterday and I don't think you can have too much in one day, but we had an amazing Bubby Gooling experience by the side of the road that um, wonderful Jack Shaw recommended to us, cooked with Jack. Um, so thank you for him for sharing all of his his um, tips in many ways there. The trip inspired ours. You know, I, I don't know if anyone saw the, the Hope Street ra radio takeover at Potato Head also, but um, seeing how much fun they were having definitely made us want to get here. So um, there's an amazing creative community here and um, the people who work at, um, at the hotel specifically, Sophia and Kai are an incredible food minds and incredibly creative so yeah we've been really lucky to have wonderful tips so far um yeah the bubby gooling was incredible the the skin was like glass and each part of the pig was treated differently but with utmost care and incredible rice and oh gosh yeah <laughs> we're having a nice time but it's funny we're, we're trying to pretend like we're working still so um you know we've got a computer on one hand and a bintang in the other <laughs> oh, that sounds absolutely perfect. Isn't that like the whole um, like remote office dream? Like that we should we should all be able to do that. I know they they keep saying, "Come on, just move here." You know, we've we've got jobs. Come, so you know that's something we can hope for one day. Yeah, um, and you know, when I think about people returning from Bali, as perhaps one day you will, um, it, it's you're all supposed to be disinfecting your shoes in citric acid foot baths because of. Um, the presence of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia. Has that message been disseminated widely to Australian tourists in Bali? Um, I feel like that message has been communicated really well within Australia and I think it's certainly nothing to be balked at. Um, I haven't seen so much information on this side, but I'm really hoping so that on the way back in that is something that's really clearly communicated because, um, yeah, it's a huge risk. And I think if you're going to travel anywhere, you have to be really cognizant of those risks and really sensitive to them. It's um, all well and good to have a, a lovely holiday. But, yeah, if you don't know the full picture of where you're going and what impacts that might have, yeah, I think it's a little ignorant. So, um, yeah, we're definitely – ourselves going to be taking that very seriously. Like, luckily, we love cleaning shoes. We actually did a, clean, a shoe cleaning pop up at one event where we um, cleaned other people's shoes on, on, on their behalf. Um, very unrelated to, to foot and mouth, of course, but yeah, um, we're experts at that, thankfully. I love that. Well, yeah, thank, thank you for spreading the shoe hygiene message um, in all different ways, Fred. That's, that's really good. Um, so I'd love to just speak a bit more broadly about, you know, the practice that you have and the kinds of events you do and the way you think about food and what do you think it brings to the food space? You know, I guess, you know, people that listen to this podcast are pretty obsessed by food and gathering around food. What do you think... I mean, did you see that there was something missing in the food space that you wanted to add to it, or do you feel like there's is there an overall aim to what you to what you do? Oh, it's a good question. I think, yeah. I, I mean, I think what we hope to bring is like always a sense of, you know, a sense of charm and, and play. I think a little bit. Um, you know, food is so fun, and I think is how a lot of people get their entertainment. Um, and I, and I really appreciate when that's taken super seriously, but I guess what we kind of hope to open up is like, yeah, a, a sense of relaxed kind of integration into events that's really fun. And, um, you know, we, we are always learning lots of different, um, I don't know where I'm going here, really. I, I guess the question is, is um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> is hard is hard to answer in the in the sense that yeah, we're we're always doing different things, and I think for different events we bring different things. Um, I think people come to us because they hope to get something that is quite different to what they've had in the past, and I think that's something that we always have to strive for is to bring new and and and, and novel ideas into food and service, and um, yeah, I think it should yeah. Mm. I mean, what kind of food experiences do you love? Apart from Bobby Gooling on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, you know, food is always about the company and, and, and the exploration of food, you know, for me, it's as much the journey of like getting the perfect meal as it is ever eating it. Um, it's about how things are coming together and all of the elements which make, you know, a meal or a room sing, you know, 
lighting is not to be undervalued, you know, the the right level of music, the company, um, you know, interesting things on the table, you know, I think all of it certainly makes such a big impact on how we taste. Um, it's an interesting thing. It's like we're not searching for a perfect meal, but we're searching for events that have a lot of elements that often are over, even overlooked and that's okay by us, you know, our, our events and the way we approach things is very detail orientated, but, um, it's not for everyone. You know, we hope that, you know, one person might notice one thing and someone else might notice a different thing, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot in there and there's a lot of texture for, for various people's interests. Um, certainly food, but yeah, I think beyond that is, is I guess what we hope to, to offer is, um, yeah, something a little bit more than just what's on the plate. You know, we're, we're really lucky because we get to work with a whole heap of different collaborators. You know, we're, we're cooks, but we're not chefs. So, you know, we work with an amazing, um, an amazing group of different chefs and they always bring so much to our events where it's as rewarding for us as it is anyone else. So, um, yeah, I guess it's that, that feeling of reward and that feeling of collaboration is really important to what we do. Yeah, I love that. Um, So, I mean, I know you've just put out a book and you're just doing your events and I don't want to put any pressure on, but (laughs) do you have anything else in the wings or any sort of ideas that are fermenting? Oh, um, in the wings is maybe a good segue to our next event. So we um, are working on an event called Contentious Buffet at Winter Wild Festival where um, I'm really excited to be dipping our toes into a new field, which is looking at cricket and bug protein. So um, that event centers around the wonderful, you know, alternative protein source being bugs. You know, 80% of the world eat insects where the kind of 20% of the world, you know, in modern Australia that seem to put their nose up in it, up at it, despite, you know, a thousands of years history of our first people eating them and, um, you know, it being a large food source. So this event looks at specifically cricket protein um, and crickets and kind of gets people excited about, you know, maybe looking after some crickets or growing some crickets. They're quite incredible, um, in terms of a protein source, you know, they take 95% less land than, um, than cattle for the same amount of meat. They take 26, 26 times less water, you know, they take eight times less food, you know, so they're quite incredible as an, as we're not, we're not suggesting that, um, we want them to replace all of our food, but yeah, as a, as an alternative and sustainable choice, um, so that event is quite fun and definitely something that's got us thinking differently about food um, and maybe something that will kind of creep into other events in the, in the, in the future. Um, no pun intended there. <laughs> <laughs> well, when um, I ate Adam James's food at the Rough Rice pop-up at Future Food System in Melbourne, the, the house that was built by Yost Backer and Joe Barrett and Matt Stone, which was all about closed loop and sustainability, there was a little, I don't know what you call it, like a barrel of crickets just um, sitting there and they were definitely, you know, part of um, – yeah, part of the ecosystem there and eaten in all number of different ways. And it, I mean, that's, it's so, it's, it, it's really, yeah, it makes me reflect on what you said before about people will take different things from an experience. It's so funny because when I went to that house, there was also a mushroom wall and there was also like, you know, vegetable boxes and all that kind of stuff. And I did think, oh, I'm going to grow mushrooms at home, but I didn't actually, for some reason, think, oh, I'm going to have crickets um, on the kitchen bench. But actually, yeah, like, why aren't I? Like, why didn't that uh, click for me um, until you just talked about it then? So, yeah, it's so interesting, the different blocks that we have. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it is an interesting one. And obviously, we've found an interesting link beyond that being that they're really related to the prawns and shellfish. Um in actual fact, if you have allergies to shellfish, you're likely allergic to crickets, you know. Um, and I think that that's a good way of getting people to kind of question why they have such a strong neophobia around eating eating them. Um, you know, if you look at a prawn, they're not very attractive looking either <laughs> and quite similar with their exoskeleton and, you know, we happily eat them. So, yeah, there's interesting parallels between, yeah, you know, having a little farm or a mushroom farm or a cricket farm um, and, yeah, using space in, in kind of creative ways. We had a cricket farm set up in our office for the last couple of weeks and they make the most amazing noise, of course. So chirping crickets, if you're into like white noise and um, relaxing soundtracks, that was quite an amazing um, added benefit we didn't quite factor in. 
Ah, oh, wow. I just wanted to get into that ASMR of crickets now. Um, <laughs> um, okay, absolutely love it. Um, well, Fred, it's been so great to dive into the world of long prawn with you today. Um, I wish you such great events in Bali and then back um, back in Victoria on the Great Ocean Road. Uh, and yeah, I will continue to <laughs> look um, look through the book and get inspired to um, create such dishes as what will I look at? Well, yeah, I never knew that um, Baba Ganoush was pampered papa. That was um, that was a good one and what else yeah ants up a tree oh and nuns farts yeah I was reading that in bed last night it's all very just like whimsical and fun but also practical and makes you think so love it love what you do oh thanks appreciate appreciate um your interest and, and taking the time to hear a bit more okay clean those shoes yeah <laughs> of course thanks very <laughs> okay. much see ya bye This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. Peace.